Um, welcome everybody to uh, yet another lecture in the Extreme Belief Lecture Series. I'm going to give the floor to Jakob Olhorst, who will introduce our speaker in a minute. But before I do so, let me draw your attention to two things um, that are upcoming. The first one is the workshop on extreme beliefs, extremism, and subjectivity on the 4th and 5th of April. Lots of good speakers. I think it's going to be an exciting event. Um, so you can still register. Uh, please do so if you're interested. And the second thing is the next lecture in the series, which is by Julia Abner on the 16th of May. And the title and abstract of that lecture will soon be online. So check the website uh, if you want to continue to be uh, updated about that one. So let me give the floor to Jakob now. Yeah, hello everybody. Uh, so our speaker tonight is Peter Nanninger. He's uh, an assistant professor at the at Groningen University, and he's an expert uh, in Middle Eastern studies. He's an expert on Islamism and media, and uh, his recent book uh, is called appeared with Cambridge University Press on uh, Islam and suicide attacks. And uh, he will talk to us about meaning making in jihadist propaganda. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for, uh, for this kind introduction. Thanks for uh, having me. Thanks for the invitation. I'm looking forward to uh, discussing my research, uh, part of my research with, with you. Um, my talk today will uh, is part of a project of mine um, focusing on jihadi violence. Um, I uh, am working on a monograph. I hope it will be published in 25, perhaps 26, with uh, Hearst. Um, and uh, so it's an ongoing project. It's still a bit preliminary work, so uh, feedback is very welcome, and uh, I'm looking forward to it. To your thoughts and insights. Um, well, the um, basic question that is behind this project is on jihadi violence, and this is well something that that I myself, but I guess also you, uh, many other people have been intrigued with since since 9/11. Probably um, is why do people commit these acts of violence? Um, acts of violence like suicide bombings, but also executions, beheadings. Well, we've seen a lot of awful violence over the last years. Um, but in addition also, what, why do people support groups that commit these kinds of violence? Why, what, what, is, what is the appeal of these groups? Um, why are they not offended or repelled by these kinds of violence? Or, or what is perhaps even the appeal of violence to people? Um, well, this is this is the, the basic question behind my uh, behind my project. I will explain in a minute um, how I am approaching this. In this talk, I would like well first to talk a bit about my uh, approach to violence, um, what I what I label the cultural approach to violence, and uh, then I will discuss two examples of very prominent themes in relation to jihadi violence. Um, first, honor and humiliations honor and humiliation, and second, conceptions of purity and pollution that are often related to violence by jihadis. Um, so this is the, the basic structure of my, uh, my talk today. Um, to explain my approach, first a bit on previous research on jihadi violence. Um, and this is not a comprehensive overview, obviously, and it's also a bit uh, an, a, it is an oversimplification of the of the hundreds thousands of, of very valuable pub publications on the issue, but I think uh, three kinds of research are particularly relevant for my purpose. In the first place, there's a lot of research on jihadi violence itself, um, but this research often focuses on violence from a well, strategic perspective, why do organizations commit these kinds of violence? And violence is perceived as a, in an instrumental fashion, as a, as, a, as a means towards achieving certain goals, like uh, terrorizing enemies or uh, drawing media attention or, uh, well, these kinds of strategic goals that groups have with violence. Second, 
there is, of course, a lot of research on the perpetrators of violence, uh, research on radicalization pathways, processes of radicalization, uh, how do people get to support violence or to commit violence. Um, and uh, third, there is a lot of research on the ideological and especially religious background of uh, jihadi violence. Um, but I should say in this kind of, in, in the research on the religious background of jihadi violence, religion is often interpreted in a quite narrow sense, um, in the sense that it is focusing on the theology, on the dogmas, the doctrines, uh, the beliefs behind the violence, on uh, important Islamic source material, Islamic concepts, Islamic doctrines, um, on jihadi ideologues, jihadi writings, texts are very important. Um, this focus on beliefs has been has been problematized by several scholars over the last couple of years, by Olivier Roy, for example, by Lauren Dawson, and also by uh, Rick Pills himself uh, in his uh, Orazi, or at least in the published version of it. Um, and I think this, uh, and I fully agree with these scholars that um, this is this is a too narrow interpretation of religion, that it, that it is more than just belief. Uh, some have called it, it's not just religion, but it's religiosity. Some have said it's not just belief, it's it's faith. Um, and I fully agree with these uh, these interpretations. Well, these are these are three very important lines of research on jihadi violence, um, all very valuable in, in themselves. But I also have the impression that something is missing, or at least being understudied. And uh, this is the question: How jihadis themselves perceive their violence? How they perceive the actual acts of violence, what are the meanings they attribute to the violence? So not so much the strategies, not violence in this instrumental way, but violence in relation to the meanings they have for the, for the jihadis themselves. And well, this is when we are talking about meanings, about processes of meaning making, we are talking about uh, culture, uh, what, what Clifford Goertz called uh, culture as a uh, web of meanings uh, in uh, that that get, make sense to the people themselves, through which people make sense of themselves and the world around them. Um, and so this is why I, I have labeled this uh, the, the cultural approach. Others have used this this term as well. A cultural approach to violence, uh, which again approaches violence not as this uh, instrument from an instrumental perspective, but from uh, well a more interpretive perspective, as Clifford Woods called it. Violence as a meaningful social action, as as action actions that that carry meanings for the people involved. Um, of course, acts of violence carry different meanings for different people, for audiences, for bystanders, for perpetrators, for supporters of perpetrators. What I am mainly interested in is uh, the meanings uh, the acts of violence have for jihadis themselves. And I am studying these meanings uh, by studying jihadi propaganda. Um, so what I am interested in is how jihadi organizations, jihadi groups, through propaganda, participate in these processes of meaning making, how they construct meaning of their acts of violence. And um, well, I think uh, I'm, I'm so so this means I'm interested in insiders perspectives on violence. Um, also joining recent research uh, focusing on, on insiders perspectives, uh, research that that uh, well as, as several scholars labeled it, emphasized that we need to take their perspective serious, that we need to take their words serious. Um, and uh, you can do so by interviewing. You can also do, I think, by uh, analyzing uh, propaganda. Of course, this has uh, just like interviewing methodological problems, right? like uh, propaganda by groups like Al-Qaeda, Islamic State, does not represent the meanings of the violence. It does not say something about the meanings that, that the violence has for individual perpetrators or supporters. But what I am interested in is exactly how 
the Islamic State, Al Qaeda, groups like that, try to construct these meanings, how they participate in these processes of meaning, uh, of, of, of meaning making. Um, well, in doing so, uh, this I, I think this 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 uh, approach also fits within um, a another recent trend in research on jihadism, which is research on jihadi culture. Um, re in recent years, there have been published a lot of uh, articles, books, most prominent among them this edited volume by uh, Thomas Heckhammer um, on jihadi culture. Um, by scholars arguing we should not just not just focus on on the political, socio-economic, psychological, etc. backgrounds of, of, of violence, but we should also study culture in order to understand why, in, in order to understand the appeal of violence and the appeal of groups that commit violence. Um, so we have seen a lot of research on, for example, um, poetry. Uh, singing Anashi jihadi uh, hymns. Um, we have seen publications on food, on visual culture, on all different aspects of jihadi culture. Um, but what is striking in this in this field so far, I think, is that jihadi culture is not really related to violence. We uh, jihadi culture research in, in this field mainly focuses on non-violent practices by jihad. Um, and Thomas Heckhammer in this volume even defines jihadi culture as products and practices that do something other than filling the basic military need of jihadi groups. So it is about aspects that are not functionally essential to the military effort. And these are uh, aspects that he calls, um, quoting uh, the cultural anthropologist Edmund Leach, the technically superfluous frills and decorations of jihadi life. Well, this is for me. It, it is this is this is surprising because jihadi violence too is not always functionally essential. Jihadi violence also contains these superfluous frills and decorations. Um, well, here are just two small examples. The ritualization of violence, for example. Um, or, well, as you can see here, uh, ritualization, but also symbolic practices, symbolic clothing, like the orange jumpsuits, etc. cetera. Um, jihad fighters praying before they are going to battle, also ritualization of violence. So these are not re really practices necessary to gain victory, one could say, so also part of jihadi culture. They give meaning to the acts of violence. Well, these are things that I am interested in. These, one could say, technically superfluous uh, uh, frills and decorations of jihadi violence. Um, so in short, I'm, I'm focusing on processes of meaning making by studying jihadi propaganda. This, this includes both studying the violence itself, the form of the violence, the symbolic form, the ritualization, etc., but also how the violence is being represented in the videos, in the, in the propaganda. Um, things like how the violence is embedded in narratives, um, how scenes of violence are being edited, the gamification of violence in propaganda by uh, jihadi groups. Um, and to analyze these issues, I rely on literature from different fields like uh, cultural anthropology, but also by sociologists, religious study scholars, etc. Um, in this talk, I would like to uh, discuss two examples, also to make this, this a bit more concrete. Uh, focusing on the Islamic State, which will also be the main case, not the, not the only one, but the main case in my, uh, in my monograph. Um, before I will get to these uh, two examples, two illustrations, um, a short note about the sources that I'm using. Well, as you all know, the Islamic State has produced a lot of media materials over the last years of the last 10 years, but even before uh, 2014, before they announced the caliphate, they invested a lot of time and effort in their uh, 
media branch or media branches, I should say, that they established several media offices. Uh, well, as you can see here in this, in this awful graph by uh, my various esteemed colleague, Charlie Winter, um, a lot of media offices that focus on uh, particular regions, particular audiences, particular kinds of media, and they have published, well, magazines, radio broadcasts, uh, audio speeches, um, photo sets, news reports, short news reports, but also audiovisual materials like uh, the videos. And uh, my main focus is on these uh, audiovisual propaganda, uh, which I've archived uh, since the Islamic State announced its caliphate in 2014. Uh, this comes down to approximately 750 videos uh, since 2014, mainly in the first few years. Um, and uh, I've archived these uh, these videos, and these are my main. This is my. These are my main data for, for studying these uh, processes of meaning making. Um, if we look at the violence in the videos, um, we can, uh, I think, roughly divide them into three categories. Um, on the one hand, we have violence at the front lines. So this is conventional warfare, um, like just battles, but also raids, uh, warfare in the trenches, uh, the use of snipers in these battles, the use of drones in these battles. Well, I've published videos about these kinds of, of violence. Second, violence inside the caliphate. Um, this relates to, uh, for example, Sharia punishments, um, the application of laws, so the uh, punishment of, of sinners or spies, execution of them, uh, of these people, uh, but also, for example, uh, destruction of cultural heritage within uh, their ter territories at the time. And third, we have violence outside the caliphate and these include, uh, well, what we call the terrorist attacks uh, in Europe, um, but also a lot of attacks in the Middle East itself, uh, in Syria and Iraq, but also, well, you know, the examples from Egypt, for example. Um, so these are roughly the three categories of uh, uh, violence. Um, these different kinds of violence obviously have different meanings, uh, are attributed different meanings by the group. But what I'm interested in is the, is the patterns of meanings that uh, are very prominent in these videos in relation to different kinds of violence. Um, I would like to discuss two of them. And the first one is honor and humiliation. Um, these terms are very, very prominent in the Islamic State's discourse. Um, Terms like humiliation, disgrace, but also their opposites, honor, uh, dignity, and related terms like retaliation and revenge. I will explain the relation uh, in, in a minute. Um, just to illustrate, uh, in the English language magazines of the Islamic State, in Dalbek and Rumiya, um, terms like Humiliation, disgrace, honor, and dignity are used over 500 times, which is approximately once every two pages, which is really a lot. Um, and this is just English language propaganda. In, in Arabic language propaganda, it's even more. And this is also illustrated by terms like uh, zul, humiliation, and isa, honor in, in speeches of uh, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, the then caliph of the Islamic State, and uh, Abu Muhammad al-Adnani, the then spokesperson of the Islamic State. Um, they use these two terms over 200 times, which is, for example, way more than terms like caliphate or terms like jihad. Just to give you an impression of the, the prominence of these, these conceptions in Islamic State media. Um, the interesting thing is that there is a lot of literature on Islamic State's caliphate uh, the, the theological basis of the caliphate, etc. But there is hardly any literature on these conceptions in relation to the Islamic State. But we do have a lot of literature on 
honor and violence in relation to other cases. There's a lot of literature we can use from other fields, other disciplines, and apply that to the Islamic State. Um, and here are some examples of this research on honor and violence. Um, the cases, the disciplines are very diverse. It's studied by anthropologists, but also by scholars from international relations, religious studies, etc. The cases are also very diverse. Um, honor and violence is, is uh, studied by in relation to tribal contexts or re religious groups and communities, but also in relation to the mafia, Sicilian mafia, for example, um, street gangs, hooliganism. There's a, there's a lot of research on honor and violence in relation to other themes. Um, the general idea in this research, in these studies, is that um, Cases of honor and violence are often related to groups that have no formal power bases, that have no formal uh, formal position, uh, like tribes, like mafia, like street gangs, etc. Um, the power of these groups is not formally established. Therefore, for their power, their influence, their status, they are dependent on perceptions, how they are being perceived what their status is, what their reputation is. In these reputations, conceptions of honor are, in these cases, very important. And this means that when the group is disgraced, when the group is humiliated, when the group is insulted, when by any means, for example, by someone from the group being killed, that honor needs to be restored in order not to look weak. Um, and there we have this idea of, of retaliation. Um, this, this, these these uh, violations of honor can result in feelings of, of shame, uh, and this may this may fuel violence, which is then experienced as re regaining the honor of the group, regaining the honor of the community. Um, well, this is uh, but the, the, the most well-known example, honor killings, for example. If your family or your group is being violated, you can regain the honor of your group by retaliating against the perpetrators. This is the basic idea behind honor and violence. Of course, it varies per context, per group, etc., but this is the, the, the main line. Um, this general pattern can be found in many different contexts, as I said. Uh, for example, there's literature on pre-Islamic Arabia, tribal contexts in pre-Islamic Arabia, where uh, these, this, this tribal ethos, as it's called, was very important. Ideas that were largely appropriated by the earliest Muslims. And therefore, in early Islamic sources, there's also a lot of reference to these kinds of conceptions about humiliation and honor. There's also research on the context of Afghanistan, uh, the tribal context in Afghanistan, where the first jihadis operated in the 1980s. Um, for example, uh, David Edwards on the slide uh, connected the, this tribal ethos in Afghanistan to the rise of this cult of martyrdom in Afghanistan in the, in the 1980s. But also in Iraq, there's research on Iraq, humiliation in the post-Saddam era, which gave rise or contributed to the rise of Islamism. So a lot of research that is also related to the context in which jihadism operated, and as a result, it's, it's no surprise that these conceptions are also very important in, in jihadi uh, discourse. Just to give three examples, I won't read out the entire quote, but here you see three of the icons of, of jihadism. Uh, Abdullah Azam in Afghanistan in the 1980s, who related the uh, violation of honor of Muslim women to retaliation. Drop of blood shed by shed, drop of Muslim blood being shed should be retaliated. Osama bin Laden said these youths, he referred to the Mujahideen, to his own fighters, inherited characteristics like honor, generosity, etc., from the pre-Islamic times. He, he, that's interesting because the Jahiliya, the, the pre-Islamic period, is usually frowned upon by jihadis. It's the time of ignorance, the time of darkness. But Bin Laden explicitly recognizes the relationship between 
his tribal context and the values uh, in, of, that, that are important in history. And finally, Abu Musa al Sarqawi, uh, in one of the videos in which he actually committed violence. This is from a video in which he beheaded an American uh, in Baghdad in 2004. He said, just before the beheading itself, that uh, the dignity of Muslim men and women in Abu Ghraib and others is not redeemed except by blood and salt. So explicitly relating the violence to these ideas of honor and humiliation, retaliation of the uh, honor of the Ummah that was being violated. Well, um, the Islamic State appropriated these kinds of ideas. Um, the Islamic State has this general narrative that once the Ummah was glorious, once the Islamic community was glorious, but now it's being humiliated all over the world, in the Middle East, in Europe, everywhere. Um, this is caused by the enemies, but also by the Muslims, by the Ummah itself. The Ummah has fallen asleep, it's slumbering. Uh, Islam has become corrupted over the years, over the centuries. And since we deviated from this pure faith, from this pure Islam of the first generations, we are now not successful anymore and we are being humiliated all over the world. Um, and the Islamic State says, well, what should we do to, uh, to uh, what's the solution for this, for this problem? Well, the solution is to return to pure faith, to, to return to the Islam of Salaf al-Saleh, the, the first generations of Muslims. Um, and then glory and honor will be restored with the help of God. Um, and this, the Islamic State said, it says is exactly what we are doing. We are returning to this pure Islam and we are restoring the dignity and honor of the of, of Islam and of the Ummah. Um, if we look at the materials, these ideas about honor and humiliation, uh, regaining the honor of the Ummah is, is uh, connected to two different dimensions in the Islamic State's propaganda. Uh, the first one is the honor is being restored by establishing the caliphate. The caliphate, based on the prophetic methodology, based on the pure Islam of the first generations, and that brings might and dignity for the Muslims. Well, this is a quote from, again, this spokesperson, Muhammad al-Adnani, uh, saying, we are in oceans of, degree, of disgrace, etc. Uh, and we should remove the garments of this honor, shake off the dust of humiliation and disgrace. The dawn of honor has emerged anew. This is what he said on the day that the, that the Islamic State established its, its caliphate 10 years ago. Um, so establishing the caliphate, establishing this, re-establishing pure Islam will bring uh, honor again to the, uh, to the Ummah. But second, the Islamic State also explicitly connects these ideas to its acts of violence. Um, several examples. In the first place, the battlefield violence, the violence on the front lines, the, the warfare is often related to ideas about honor and dignity. Um, honor is in jihad is a very common phrase in Islamic State videos, uh, jihad itself is honorable. And that's the interesting thing. It is not, not so much about the results of these military operations, of these raids, etc. The violence itself is honorable. Um, it shows that Muslims are not passive, that Muslims are not weak, but that Muslims stand up for their, uh, for their beliefs, for their faith, for their community. Um, and it shows that we were humiliated, but now we are retaliating and thereby restoring the honor of the Ummah. Um, so battlefield violence is, is one example. Um, a second example is martyrdom operations, often connected to these conceptions about humiliation and honor. This, this is very important in the discourse related to martyrdom, martyrdom operations, suicide attacks, as we usually call them. Um, here is just one example. This is uh, Abdullah al Shami, a Syrian fighter who sacrificed everything, according to the video. Um, he uh, first got wounded in fights, he ended up in a wheelchair, but even then, he did not stop 
fighting for the cause. Uh, what he did was that he registered for a martyrdom operation. It's, uh, he then sacrificed his family. It's a, but that's also interesting, a very interesting scene, an emotional scene in this video in which he says farewell to his daughter, to his, to his little daughter, to his crying daughter in this video. He sacrificed everything, that's what it, that's what it signals. Um, and then this disabled fighter committed this, uh, this suicide attack, which is in the narrative of the video related to ideas about honor. Um, he proceeded to his Lord in eagerness, another glorious example of honor, defense, and jihad against the enemies of religion. Um, the final quote in the video is, in this hour of peril, it was published in 2018, so when the Islamic State was having a hard time, in this hour of peril, we ask God Almighty to deliver his promise through the Mujahideen, as well as the oppressed, by whose deeds the Ummah will reclaim its honor, glory, and supremacy. Um, interesting thing. Nothing is said about the suicide attack, about the results of the suicide attack, whether it was a success or not. It is presented as an honorable act in itself. Um, third, executions are also often related to ideas about honor and humiliation. Um, these executions well, well we, we all know examples of the execution videos of the Islamic State, are typically represented as retaliation, as retaliation for what the individual or the community that the individual represents did to Muslims. They humiliated us, now we are humiliating them. That's the idea. Um, here you see again two examples well, a very famous symbol in this in this respect is the orange jumpsuit. They humiliated the Muslims in their prisons in Guantanamo, in Abu Ghraib, etc. Now we are humiliating them. And this fighter is, um, in this video, forced to dig his own grave, which is very humiliating, very dehumanizing uh, uh, in this uh, in this respect. Um, the other video is is even more well, gruesome in the first place, but also more more illustrative, I think. Um, this is a video in which two Turkish soldiers, Turkish army soldiers are being executed and they are being dehumanized uh, in this video by have, they have to crawl to their side of execution. Uh, meanwhile, a, a quote is being heard from Abaghdadi, the then caliph who compared unbelievers to dogs. Um, they have to crawl like dogs to their place of execution. And these two Turkish soldiers were executed by being burned alive. And this is also a very symbolic act of violence in the idea of, according to the Islamic State, because in their narrative, these soldiers burned Muslims by means of their bombs, and now they are being burned in retaliation by the Islamic State. Um, this is the same reasoning that was used with the Jordanian pilot, which might be a more familiar case. Um, these kinds of executions are often, again, in literature related to ideas about Sharia. For example, the idea of Fisas, which is retribution in, in Islamic law. And this, this idea of an eye for an eye, when someone does something to you, you can do the same to them. Um, so again, focusing on the beliefs, on the doctrines, um, but what is not much reflected on is these ideas about humiliation and honor that are very important in these, uh, in these cases. Um, so I think to um, conclude this, this, this example that um, it shows that the conceptions of humiliation and honor are very significant in ISIS discourse and also as an additional perspective on, on uh, ISIS violence. Um, and it also says something or could say something about the appeal of the group, the appeal of the Islamic State. Um, for example, the narrative in relation to violence plays on these themes of humiliation and disgrace, etc. Um, and the audience can, can 
relate to these feelings of humiliation and project their own feelings of humiliation, discrimination, etc., to this narrative, uh, either humiliation of themselves or humiliation by proxy, as it's called, for example, by identifying with Muslim brothers and sisters that are being suppressed in, in Palestine or in Syria. Um, so people can relate to this message and this message also gives them an empowering role, um, an empowering role as avengers of the uh, of the um, and restore the dignity, as is illustrated by this uh, tweet at the top. Um, so this is uh, the first example. The second, purity and pollution. Um, and just like honor and humiliation, conceptions about purity and pollution are very central to ISIS discourse, uh, also in relation to its violent actions. Here are two examples on the slide uh, in which acts of violence are uh, related to ideas about purity, attacking the kuffar, the unbelievers, um, to purify the earth from the corruption that had, that tainted it. Um, and the soldiers of the Khilaf, uh, the, the Mujahideen, uh, had this military operation, they were successful, and this is framed as they completely cleansed the area. So, the, so terms like purifying, purification, cleansing, etc. And on the other hand, defilement, pollution, filth, etc. are also very important in the discourse of the Islamic State. Um, this again is interesting because uh, it's not much reflected on in literature on jihad in relation to jihadism, but it is, these conceptions are also very prominent in other cases of violence. Again, so the same idea as with honor and humiliation, um, meaning that there is quite some literature about the relation between these conceptions and acts of violence. Uh, one example being literature in the field of genocide studies, study research on, on genocide uh, mass violence. Um, another example is research on religious fundamentalism, uh, where I, which are also uh, related to ideas about purity and pollution. And I will briefly again explain the, the main ideas from this literature. Here you see some examples from both fields. Um, well, in general, ideas since, since Mary Douglas' uh, famous uh, book, Purity and Danger, um, ideas about purity uh, are, by researchers, related to how people categorize the world. Um, how people construct categories, how people construct categories, and how things move between these categories or fall in between these categories. And these things are often considered impure. Um, for I think about uh, the categories of male and female or life and death, things that cross these categories can be considered impure in specific cultures. Um, this is also related to uh, cases of violence by religious fundamentalists, by cases of genocide and mass, mass violence. Um, as research has, uh, has, has shown in these cases, uh, groups, fundamentalist groups, but also in cases of genocide, uh, often a very dualistic or manichaeistic worldview is in order. So a black and white picture of, of, of good and bad, us versus them, uh, with high boundaries between the in-group, the good, and the out-group, uh, the bad. Um, the in-group is considered pure, the out-group, outside world, is considered impure, polluted. Um, what is often the case is that these groups find themselves in a situation of conflict, conflict between the in-group and the out-group. And in cases of violence, the in-group is often considered as being under threat. Uh, the in-group is being threatened, um, in some cases even in its survival as a group. Um, and this threat, this, this situation is caused not just by the enemies, but also by the pollution of the own group, the pollution of the in-group, 
the in-group that was once pure in these imaginar ima imaginaries, but that has become corrupted over the years. Um, and this has caused the decline of the power of the status of these groups, etc. This has caused these troubles. So what needs to be done is that these boundaries between in-group and out-group have to be restored. Um, and this is the need for purification. We need to purify the in-group, re restore the boundaries between the in-group and, uh, and the outside world. Um, in research, roughly two ways of this quest for purification are are being identified. Um, groups can either withdraw from the world, like in the case of religious fundamentalists or, or sects, as they are called in the United States, for example, with several examples like Waco, Jonestown, etc., or by world conquering purification. And this is often the case in cases of genocide, in cases of uh, terrorism. Um, so these again are, are some, some basic insights from, from literature that again can be applied to the, uh, to the Islamic State. Um, well, I think this is, this is quite straightforward, right? The Islamic State also has this du dualistic worldview, this manichaeistic worldview, the world is divided in two camps, uh, the believers and the unbelievers. Um, and uh, we are now in a crisis, we are in a sense of we are being threatened, the Ummah is being threatened, the Ummah is being humiliated, we just noted. Um, and what we have to do is we have to restore the purity of our group, we have to restore the boundaries between us and them. Um, so we have to get rid of the, the, the pollution, the contamination of our own group. Um, we have to go back to this pure Islam and this is uh, this, this quest for purification. Um, so here we see these, these basic ingredients that we, that we have uh, seen also in, in uh, research on fundamentalism and, and cases of genocide. Um, this quest for purification is related to violence. Um, and again, a few examples just to illustrate this point, uh, also to show that, that the Islamic State makes this connection between purification and violence. Um, in the first place, an interesting case in this respect is destruction of cultural heritage in Syria and Iraq. Um, well, we all know the examples, uh, destructions of, of churches, of shrines, but also uh, the Mosul Museum uh, destructions. Uh, Palmyra is a, is a well-known example. Um, a lot of cultural heritage that has been destroyed. Um, this can be perceived, this can be interpreted as attempts to purify the lands to purify the lands of the caliphate, the lands that were contaminated by these symbols of shirk, as the Islamic State called them, these symbols of idolatry. Um, this, is the, this is an example from, from the magazine Darbik uh, related to the destruction of the Mosul Museum, um, where the Islamic State says, the unbelievers had unearthed these statues and ruins in recent generations and attempted to portray them as part of a cultural heritage and identity that the Muslims of Iraq should embrace and be proud of. Yet, this opposes the guidance of Allah and his messenger and only serves the nationalist agenda. So one could wonder why would they destroy these statues? They are not being worshipped anymore, but the, the Islamic State says, these uh, are symbols of Iraqi nationalism. Iraqi nationalism is wrong, it's shirk, it's, it's idolatry to identify with the nation above the Ummah, etc. Um, so these symbols should be restored. Uh, these are, they should be destroyed. Um, these, these statues are kind of boundary markers between us and them, and they need to be removed, and then the, the boundaries are being restored again, the, uh, the, the, the lands of Islam are being purified. Um, another example, well, and that we get to the case of genocide is, is non-Muslim minorities living in the caliphate, um, most well known the case of the Yazidi, um, which, which has been designated as a, as a genocide by the uh, United Nations, for example, uh, and this concerns not just the killing of man, but also the enslavement of uh, Yazidi women and children. Um, this is also can also be related to ideas about purity and pollution. Um, the Yazidi, as uh, non-Muslims, as unbelievers living in the uh, caliphate, um, 
well, the killing of Yazidi men speaks for itself, but the enslavement, sexual violence against Yazidi women is, is in this respect, an interesting case because that's often found in situations of genocide, right? Cases of uh, Rwanda, Cambodia, uh, former Yugoslavia, etc. We, we have also seen sexual violence uh, against women. Well, and in literature, this is being interpreted typically, again, too straightforward, too, too simplified, but um, as women, as, as symbols of the purity of the group, um, purity of the lineage of the group, um, by enslaving these women, by committing sexual violence, um, it's not just these women that might be purified, but especially the children that are being purified. And this is also what the Islamic State argues in its uh, propaganda materials, but also in internal pamphlets like, uh, like these. Um, enslavement Islamizes, in the, in the words of the Islamic State, the, uh, the, the uh, Muslim territories and thereby purifies them. It, 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 uh, yeah, it purifies the territories of the, of, of the Islamic State. Um, final example. And this concerns Muslims who cross the boundaries between the Ummah, between the in-group and the out-group. So this concerns sinners and spies, um, people who committed sin, cross the boundaries between good and bad, between the in-group and the out-group, uh, and spies, that's even clearer that they cross these boundaries. Um, so this is related to the application of Sharia in the, in the Islamic Caliphate, uh, and especially the Hudud, which are um, in Islamic law, particular punishments uh, that are in order for particular crimes. These are being mentioned in the Quran. Well, uh, well-known examples are that thieves uh, should be punished by cut, cutting off the hands. Um, well, you see in a, an example here in this, uh, in, this, in this picture, these were public rituals um, that restore the boundaries between right and wrong. Um, these are rites of purification as they can be uh, interpreted. And the same with uh, uh, executing spies. Um, this is also by the Islamic State explicitly related to ideas about purity. For example, the video in which is this spy is being crucified is uh, entitled Okisas, uh, Retribution of the Impure Spy. So again, this is a right of purification. Um, so same as with the idea of honor and, and humiliation, I think these are important themes to take into account in order to understand how jihadis perceive violence. Um, also because they are related to um, prominent themes, for example, in research on radicalization. Uh, they are related to in-group and out-group selfing and othering, related to identity construction, related to feelings of belonging, etc. cetera. Um, these, this is an important theme in research on radicalization, an important theme in, in processes of radicalization. So I think it's also, uh, from that respect, important to take this into account. A um, few concluding remarks. Well, we have uh, seen violence, uh, we have approached violence as, as meaningful social practices, taking jihadis uh, seriously. Um, I've discussed just two examples now, but I could have discussed many of these meanings like sacrifice, like ritualization, like authority, many different uh, themes that, that are important to understand the meanings of violence for jihadis themselves. Um, these themes, second point, are very, well, the, the meanings given to violence are very central to jihadist themes like honor and purity are very central to jihadi dis discourse in general. Um, they are also related to themes that are very central to, to jihadism. For example, well, as, we, as we've seen, boundaries between in-group and out-group, um, ideas about pure Islam. Um, these meanings are related to central values within the, within the Islamic State. And as such, these acts of violence can also be interpreted as, as performances that, that, that express jihadism itself in, in, in terms 
of Clifford Goertz again. Um, Clifford Goertz spoke about practices that by means of which a group tells a story about themselves. Um, acts of violence can, I think, also be seen as a story they tell, jihadists tell themselves about themselves. Goertz made this uh, uh, statement in relation to his study on cockfights in Bali. I'm not sure whether you are familiar with this, uh, with this article. It's a famous article about cockfights in the, uh, on the Indonesian island of Bali. And these were also practices that for outsiders seemed kind of irrational to participate in. Goertz did not study the background of the participants, the, the, the radicalization processes of these participants. Goertz studied the practices themselves, the meanings of these practices. And by doing so, he was able to make sense of these practices to a certain extent, of course. Um, and I think this is also something we, we should do more with jihadi. Um, well, as we already indicated, studying these meanings is also important for understanding the appeal of jihadism. It is related to these concepts, ideas that are seen as very important in processes of radicalization. Uh, things like belonging, empowerment, etc. Um, so I think this is an, an additional argument why, why this uh, approach is, is, is valuable. And um, fourth, well, you see a, a question mark behind this point, but uh, this is so. This is something that I would also like to discuss with uh, with with you. This might also be useful regarding other forms of extremism. Um, I focus on the Islamic State now, or a bit on jihadism more in general, but I also see some resemblances, for example, with right wing extremism. Uh, ideas about the purity of the group, ideas about honor in relation to the actions, the violence committed by right-wing extremists, etc. Um, so in this respect, I also think that this, this uh, uh, approach is, is, is useful for, 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 cross, for comparative research, for, for cross-disciplinary research in that sense. So I'm looking forward to your ideas on this uh, on this last point in uh, in particular, but also, of course, in general. Right. Thank you.